A good and of Shabbos. This Shabbos is a very special Shabbos on many accounts. Around the world, this very Shabbat, as far as we know, in every Jewish community that's connected to the internet, Jews are aware that this Shabbos carries the designation of the Shabbat Project. Its originator, Rabbi Dr. Warren Goldstein, the chief rabbi of South Africa, is titling it this year, Keeping It Together. Not much makes me happier than a good double entendre, and this one could not be more perfect to the moment. The phrase, keeping Shabbat, keeping it, from the Ten Commandments, shamor et yom Shabbat, keep or guard or protect the Shabbat, the seventh day, touches so deeply on the essence of being a committed Jew. Of course, there are many paths to commitment, it's very true, and yet the commitment to Shabbat and all that goes with it expresses a very deep and timeless truth about Jewish being and Jewish identity. Now the truth is that it's what we are that's the essential expression of our Jewishness, even more than anything we do, even more than Shabbat itself. And yet, when we're faced with the question of what are we here for, what is the meaning of our life and our being in this world for however many years we're privileged to be here, how do we make the most of our days? Shabbat is at the heart of what it means to live a full and complete Jewish life. So by focusing intense light on Shabbat, one Shabbat, this Shabbat, for the past 10 years, Rabbi Goldstein and his team of organizers have presented this opportunity to Jews everywhere, no matter what our prior degree of connection, to engage, to celebrate, study, rejoice, sing, pray, keep, to keep it, to keep it together. Together with Jews around the world, we're honoring and keeping this Shabbat as one people with one heart. Since Shabbat four weeks ago, which was also Shmini Atzeres, also Simchas Torah in Israel, part of our world has come unglued. Part of us has come apart. We have known anxieties, horrors, and fears that we thought were left way back in the last century. Things that we thought we would never see again. We were mistaken, and it's been a challenge now to keep ourselves together. How, in such a world gone mad, could we possibly keep it together? Again, the eternal wisdom of Torah, of God, the creator of the world, and all life in it offers us a life preserver. Here, hold on to this. Keep this. This is how you keep it together. We are encouraging everyone this Shabbat especially, to make an extra effort. Find something extra to do this Shabbat that deepens and strengthens your commitment and connection to Shabbat. Push yourself a little bit to make that extra effort. From inviting guests, to designating an extra half hour of Torah study, to giving a few coins to tzedakah before candle lighting for those who don't do so already, whatever you can find and the shabbosproject.com website linked in your email has great suggestions. Please feel welcome to ask. Never be shy to ask. This Shabbos is also a very special day on the Jewish calendar. It's the 20th of Cheshvan, Chav Cheshvan, which marks the Yortzeit of Rabbi Jonathan Sachs of blessed memory who passed away three years ago. On a Yortzeit we say Kaddish, we say L'chaim, we wish long life to those saying Kaddish, and we say, May the soul experience an ascent. This is because our tradition teaches that the souls of the righteous have no rest in this world nor in the next. The end of the Gemara in Bracha says, Amar bar Ashi Amar Rav, Talmidi Chachamim have no rest in this world nor in the world to come. They go from strength to strength. The ascent of their souls is ongoing. In other places it describes the influence a righteous person has on the world after his passing, perhaps greater even than during his lifetime. 
We appreciate that no one lives forever, and we acknowledge with gratitude that Rabbi Sachs put in an awesome effort to leave us with instruction, insight, inspiration, and guidance in the dozens of books and hundreds of essays and articles and lectures that he left us before he was taken from us at a young age. He did what he could. Now it's up to us to take in that legacy and make it ours by putting his words and teachings into practice in our lives. In honor of the Yortzeit, and may his neshama have an aliyah, let's study a few of Rabbi Sachs' teachings on this week's Parsha and this moment's significance in history and take insight and inspiration and new vigor for living a Jewish life from the teachings of Harav Yaakov Tzvi ben David Aryeh Zichrono Levracha. Our Parsha of Vayera opens with Avraham welcoming strangers into his tent, travelers, foreigners, Arabs. He does not know that they're angels. He sees them as weary travelers who could use a rest, a drink, and a nash. He invites them in to be his guests, which is notable in and of itself. But most notable is that this takes place at the very moment that God is visiting Avraham, who is recovering from a recent procedure, shall we say. Avraham actually turns aside from God to greet these strangers and make them feel comfortable and welcome. From here we derive the mandate that welcoming guests is tantamount to, if not greater than, welcoming the Divine Presence. Rabbi Sachs highlights one of the most beautiful comments in this episode given by Rabbi Shalom of Belz, who noted that in verse 2, the visitors are spoken of as standing above Avraham. The verse says, Nitzavim alav. In verse 8, just a few verses later, Avraham is described as standing above them. Omed alehem, says the verse. Rabbi Sachs said, at first, the Belzer Rebbe said, at first, the visitors were higher than Abraham because they were angels and he a mere human being. But when he gave them food and drink and shelter, he stood even higher than the angels. We honor God, right, right, writes Rabbi Sachs, by honoring his image, humankind. Using our finite and limited minds to try to grasp the infinite, we talk about God as a parent. We know that our parents are where we come from, and God is where everything comes from. God is Avinu Malkenu, as we said over and over throughout Elul and Tishrei. In this week's Parsha, Avraham is learning how to be a father too, and God is teaching him how it works. At the beginning of his journey, our hero is called Avram, a great father. He becomes Avraham with the addition of the hey, which is an initial of God's name, as he's going to become Avhamon Goyim, father of many nations, not just one. So last week we, we heard God's call to Avraham, Lech Lecha, go out, leave your father's house, the place of your birth. And at the end of this week's Sedra, we have God's command to Avraham to bring his son Yitzchak, Isaac, up as an offering on Mount Moriah. How is this a lesson in fatherhood? What kind of father is God calling on Avraham to be? One that leaves home? One that's willing to sacrifice his son? Says Rabbi Sachs, that's not the central message here. The most important message here is that faith is not certainty. It's the courage to live with uncertainty. Avraham knew that God's promises would come true, so he could live with the uncertainty of not knowing how or when. In this moment, we're living in times of much greater uncertainty than we would have thought. If you would have asked us five weeks ago, we would have given a very different answer then than today. Some bits of humankind that we thought were cure, were, we were cured of had consigned to history, have been awakened and enlivened, most alarmingly, anti-Semitism in the form of anti-Israelism. Many of us in Shul read a book together in 2010, right after it came out, 
a book by Rabbi Sachs titled Future Tense, Jews, Judaism, Israel, and the 21st Century. It's worth taking down from the bookshelf and having a look if you haven't looked at it in a while. The last chapter is titled Future Tense, The Voice of Hope in the Conversation of Humankind, which tells you a lot about the tenor of this book. It was published in 2009, and Future Tense has a chapter on anti-Semitism which is titled The Fourth Mutation. Rabbi Sachs describes anti-Semitism with the metaphor of a virus which constantly mutates to make itself stick. Anti-Semitism is nothing new, but it's gone through these incarnations, these mutations over time to endure through changes in culture. As it turns out, since 2009, We've learned a lot more than we knew before about viruses and how they mutate. And we've also learned a lot more about anti-Semitism, more than we cared to know about both, frankly. But Rabbi Sachs was quite prescient on both counts. The hatred towards us is shocking in its murderous effects, surprising in its global popularity, but really nothing new under the sun. When all else fails, the Jews can always be blamed, even for their own suffering, perhaps especially for our own suffering. But Rabbi Sachs's chapter on Israel in that book is every bit as uplifting now as it was 15 years ago. If you read the press these days, which is probably not good for anyone's health, you see Israel called a settler colonialist project. Rabbi Sachs speaks so clearly to this issue. I'm quoting, It is so ironic that Israel be called an imperialist power. Israel is the only nation to have ruled the land in the past 4,000 years that has not been ruled by an empire and never sought to become one. Israel has been ruled by many empires, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, the Ptolemies, the Seleucids, the Romans, the Byzantines, the Umayyads, the Abbasids, the Fatimids, Crusaders, Mamluks, and Ottomans. The only non-imperial power to rule the land was and is Israel. But we know that the truth, the historical record, the facts as they are, are scarcely even a bother for those who wish us ill. Rabbi Sachs writes, Quote, Israel has often been accused of being a threat to peace. In fact, of the many partition, i.e. two state proposals between the Balfour Declaration and today, that's over a hundred years ago, Israel has accepted them all. Its neighbors have rejected them all. End of quote. Sachs reminds us that along with the accusation that Israel created the Palestinian refugee problem, no one ever mentions that the newly born state of Israel, at war from the moment of its inception, with very little industry, capital, or resources, in 1948 and the years following, absorbed 800,000 refugees from Arab lands immediately and fully, giving them citizenship right away. Sachs concludes this chapter with a passage titled, Choosing Life. These are some of his words. No nation is perfect, none can avoid mistakes. My attachment to Israel is not political, but religious. Israel is the land where Judaism was born almost four millennia ago. Judaism gave rise to Christianity and Islam, both of which literally or metaphorically claim descent from Abraham and Sarah. Today, there are 120 countries in which the majority of the population is Christian. There are 57 member states of the organization of the Islamic Conference. There is only one Jewish state, a tiny country, one quarter of 1% of the landmass of the Arab world. Israel has done extraordinary things. It has absorbed immigrants from 103 countries speaking 82 languages. It has developed cutting-edge agricultural and medical techniques and created one of the world's most advanced high-tech economies. 
It has produced great poets and novelists, artists and sculptors, symphony orchestras, universities, and research institutions. Wherever in the world there is a humanitarian disaster, Israel, if permitted, is one of the first to send aid. It has shared its technologies with other developing countries. Under immense strain, it has sustained democracy, a free press, and an independent, some say too independent, judiciary. Rabbi Sachs is writing this in 2009, remember. A mere three years after standing face to face with the angel of death, the Jewish people, by proclaiming the state of Israel, made a momentous affirmation of life, as if it had heard across the centuries the echo of God's words to Ezekiel, I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And a day will come when the story of Israel in modern times will speak not just to Jews, but to all who believe in the power of the human spirit as it reaches out to God, as an everlasting symbol of the victory of life over death, hope over despair. Israel has taken a barren land and made it bloom again. It has taken an ancient language, the Hebrew of the Bible, and made it speak again. It has taken the West's oldest faith and made it young again. It has taken a shattered nation and made it live again. Rabbi Sachs, to our sorrow, is no longer among us in person, but his voice and his words live on and inspire us, strengthen our faith, give us hope, and de deepen our determination to live, to live well, to live Jewishly, and to continue praying for peace in the land and truly peace for all humankind. It's taking longer than we'd hoped, but the day will come. Shabbat Shalom.